This is Voice the Culture, a podcast for the modern day confused citizen. Hello, I'm your podcast founder, Kelly. Hi, Kelly. It's Vicky. Very great to see you today. Such a great honor to be invited to your podcast. Um, and then my team. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Michelle. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Good, good. I'm very well, thank you. I'm Amy. Hi, I'm Carolyn. Hi, nice Carolyn. to meet you, Vicky. Thank you. Okay, so thank you all so much for introducing yourself, and welcome back to another episode on Waste of Culture. So today we have a very special guest who is a young Chinese woman and a recent university graduate. She's currently working full-time while chasing her dreams of becoming a lawyer or a public policymaker. She is passionate about racial and social justice, and she is a believer in positive social changes and people's power. Lastly, she is also an author of the upcoming book, Through My Eyes, Exploring the World While Being Asian. Please welcome Vicky Zhou. Oh, thank you. This is, the, this is the, the best intro I ever heard about myself. Thank you so much. You. Maybe it's also- <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, to um, start off um, with your book, did you have any strong connections with your Chinese culture growing up? Mm-hmm. I actually love this question when I was reading the guide. Um, so I actually grew up in China most of uh, for the majority time of my life. I grew up in China until 17. And that's when I uh, went abroad to UK first for gap year and then to Canada uh, to pursue, well, to, to study for university. Um, so I consider myself very strongly connected with my Chinese culture. I know that it's not an automatic for people who grew up in China, they're just automatically connected with the Chinese culture. But I feel I was very lucky because uh, my grandfather, he very intentionally and um, planted the, you know, the Chinese culture, the Chinese roots in me. So I grew up um, just reading a lot of Chinese literature, classics. Um, I'm sure maybe uh, some of you are, you know, know the elder Chinese people, they really care about those um, uh, disciplines. So yeah, so I actually grew up studying uh, calligraphy with my grandpa, reading a lot of Chinese literature, classics. So I feel like I was very, I didn't realize how interested I was in the Chinese culture until I moved away uh, from the homeland. And I realized, hey, actually those stuff, those seeds that he planted in me really had a purpose. And so while I study abroad, you know, you know, reading the Western philosophy and stuff, I feel like, wow, those stuff that I learned when I was younger about Chinese philosophy, about Chinese culture really had a purpose. It really helped. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you were talking about how you were reading more about Western philosophy, and I was wondering if um, when you were writing your book, if you had any revelations about the Asian community or about yourself? Mm -hmm. I think it was always very interesting to compare and contrast the Western ideology with the Eastern or Chinese ones. Um, very interestingly, I feel like the Western um, social science or political science, which is uh, what I did in, uh, in university, sociology and political science, I feel like they very intensely focus on the Western perspective, for example, you know, like individualism, um, even when they talk about not just individuals, like as persons, but when they talked about nations to nation, countries to countries, they focus so much on how individuals things or like how each country as an independent. Um, however, I feel like very interestingly in uh, Eastern culture, uh, we think of a lot of things as they're interconnected. So for example, you um, as a person in relation to your neighbors, you know, you think of each other as a community, as a collective, right? Um, so I feel like that's very interesting to, to see the comparison there. You know, a lot of times when I think of um, how we interact with each other, you know, we think of ourselves as community, as we have to support each other rather than I'm just an independent person. I don't care what you think of me or what, you know, what what you think in general. So I think it's kind of interesting to see that contrast in uh, even how that is integrated, integrated into uh, studies, social science, or, you know, bigger things. And, um, Adding on to um, Amy's question, um, what perspectives slash beliefs around the Asian communities did you challenge with this work? Mm, very good question. Um, so first of all, I think definitely the model minority myth. 
I know that's a very trendy topic that everyone is talking about right now, but I do think uh, the model minority myth had so much harms on our Asian community and, and a lot of them, we even ourselves, we internalize that. So by that, I can elaborate a little bit more. So first is that the idea that Asians do not experience racism or xenophobia or discrimination. Um, I remember reading a part of uh, the book called Modern, uh, sorry, Minor Feelings, written by uh, Kathy Park Hong. I saw Kelly. Yeah, I read it too. I read it too. <laughs> I love that book. I read it inside out. I love every single chapter of it. Um, I remember she wrote in her book um, saying that she didn't say that, but she was quoting someone else who who said that to her, saying that um, so Asians are the next in line to white people or to whiteness. So that's compare. That's basically saying that Asian peoples also share or enjoy white privilege. Um, so I think. Unfortunately, for a lot of people, that is true to them, or they that mis misconception is accepted by them. Um, however, I think in this book, I did talk a lot about how this conception is not true, especially during uh, coronavirus, during the pandemic, right? We did see how Asian people were completely were discriminated, were isolated, and were basically associated with a virus, which a lot of people did not even have any you know, responsibility of. So I think in this book, I really challenged uh, the, idea, the idea that um, Asian-ness is adjacent to whiteness, which is not true. Um, so I went back to a little bit in history to talk about how in Canada specifically, Asian people have been um, historically excluded from the mainstream society. So I definitely wanted to challenge that. Um, and also a very quick um, second point, um, is that I also think a lot of people believe that Asian people are very isolated. We like to, we don't collaborate with other people of color. Uh, we kind of just like hang on to each other. We're just a group of ourselves. Um, I also really wanted to challenge that because um, using the great example of what happened during Black Lives Matter movement, I really think a lot of Asian people stood up for Black people um, in America and also in my in where I'm at right now in Canada. I saw a lot of great Asian allies, activists speaking up for them and really reflecting on um, the anti-Black racism within our community. So I wanted to challenge that too. I think that's such a old, you know, ideas that belongs to the past that Asian people don't interact with other people of color, don't support other. I don't think that's true. There's a lot we can work on, but I do see um, the great things are happening. Thank you so much for bringing all that up because we live in the United States, so we don't really get to hear about what's going on in Canada and what's happening to the Asian community and like other minorities that's happening over there. So it's just really reassuring to know that this isn't just um, an Amer a movement happening in North America. This is happening across the world and everyone is partaking in it. And it's so important to not just say, well, why do you have to make it about race? When race is just intertwined with so many other concepts. This is so this is how like interdisciplinary like everything is. So I wanted to like bring up like because you also talk about acknowledging colorism within the Asian community. Mm -hmm. So do you think it's like important to not only acknowledge the derogatory like slurs like in the Chinese language because I'm Chinese and I often hear people say like hey Ren or like just like things that just aren't really nice. Like how do you think we can um, take away from the normalization of these slurs and move past that and move forward as a community with other groups of um, people of color. Yeah, I actually think, um, I actually thought that was such a great question. I thought of a lot about um, how language impact or influenced how we think of other people, right? And this question actually in particular is very personal to me um, because I myself, I'm in an interracial relationship and I, I'm, I'm dating a black man. So it's very interesting when I introduce or when I speak about my relationship with my family because because I speak to them in Chinese, right? In Mandarin. Um, I realized that there's always this certain connotation, negative ones, uh, attached to Heiren when I tell them that he is a Black person or he's African, I feel like there's, it just has 
a lot of negative connotation attached to the word already before uh, they even get to meet the person as an individual himself. So then I thought, I, I actually thought about that a lot. Why is there, why, did, why just doesn't this sound good or positive? I think we can go back to history about how hey, you know, the word hey in Chinese, not only does it mean uh, black, it also means dark. Um, so, so that also goes into the colorism that has been so deeply, root, deeply rooted in our culture that we, we associate darker skin tone, darker skin tone per people to lower class people, people who are poor, um, you know, people who, um, people, people just, you know, belong to the lower social, social economic class. So I think there is already this pre-assumption to the word hey, heron. So I think we need to challenge that. And we need to, before we go beyond, you know, before we talk about race, we even need to look inside, uh, even people within our own ethnicity, Chinese people, we look at colors, we, we differentiate different skin colors. We already discriminated people who have darker skin tone. And that just extends to when we talk about race, we, that extends to when we talk about black people uh, who are from different race and they are just naturally darker skin tone. So I think there's a lot we need to challenge here. Um, and yeah, I think for Asians, for Asians, we need to internally reflect on and really think about um, how this term could be very harmful to, to, to a lot of people, especially black people, right? And also the stereotypes that attach to, to, to them as a group, yeah. Yeah, so your point about the importance of like challenging the model minority myth and colorism are like extremely interesting. And it's like really nice to hear because I think I think what you said was like extremely true, you know? And we noticed that there's a lot of topics that you're bringing up in your book and that we can't imagine the amount of research you did to have this book come together. Can you tell us more about the process and how you did it and like how this all began? Yes, um, so it actually, it seems like a very, a really big project. It sounds like writing a book, it's, it must be really heavy and very intense. Um, but I personally feel like the otherwise, because all these topics just, they're, they're very close and dear to my heart. So when I wrote about them, I really feel like, actually it was very therapeutic to me. I feel like all, uh, I had a lot of ideas, um, thoughts, just, you know, um, for, for a very long time. And I finally get to sit down, sit with myself and put them into words. So that process was kind of like a healing, a, a therapy session for me, you know, that felt really great um, being able to write them down and document them. And also um, a huge part of the book is about my personal stories. Uh, for example, traveling to the UK, living with uh, multiple different host families who from who are from completely different backgrounds, and also you know coming to Canada, kind of like rediscovering my own identity, you know, as being Asian because you know like when I used to live in China, ninety nine percent of the people look is just like me, and it's, we speak the same language, we share the same culture, same customs, and coming to here, it's like. I all of a sudden I am a minority, right? And I have to re kind of like adjust myself and also to discover what it really means to be a minority or to be Asian here. So a lot of stories just felt really natural to me and writing them down uh, felt really great. So for me, it is a, um, I did work on the book for a year consistently and I did a little bit of writing just every single day, to be honest. Um, I feel really proud be because of how committed I was and consistent I was. Um, so that felt really rewarding. I think it's very, um, I would say like inspiring to hear that you had a project that you were very passionate about and that passion um, led you to be able to work on it consistently. I know I wouldn't be able to do that, but um, like in regards to your book, um, since it's split in three sections and each section has um, subtopics for each one. And I know you're talking about how like some stories were easier to write since they were more personal, but I was wondering if there was um, any section that was difficult to write. Yeah, for sure. 
Um, a lot of topics were very heavy. They felt very heavy, especially, um, you know, the chapters focused on the anti-Asian hate crimes and the history of anti-Asian, you know, xenophobia in Canada or North America in general. Those topics felt really heavy writing them. Um, when I did my research on the history, um, you know, just reading the historical text or scripts, um, a lot of them, just the languages that they used to use, you know, uh, they're just very, uh, just overtly racist, you know, for example, um, just reading about how the first Prime Minister of Canada, um, the, you know, how he talked about Chinese people, how he wanted to implement policies and pass laws in the Congress to specifically exclude Chinese people from coming to Canada, from becoming citizens of Canada. Um, those are very, they felt really emotionally draining, for sure. Um, and, but personally, I think one of the most challenging chapters uh, was my final chapter. I added a chapter about um, challenging racism or challenging racial bias uh, within my Chinese uh, family or with my Chinese, um, you know, community. And that just felt very personal because, you know, when you write about or when you read about history or, you know, um, it's like textbooks or books, they feel like they're remote issues. Um, your social issues, but when you talk about something like challenging with your family, like challenging um, the anti-Black racism in the Chinese community, that just felt very personal. That just on a whole nother level. Um, so that's challenging because uh, that's a very necessary conversation to have uh, among a lot of, you know, within a lot of Chinese families. Um, so I really encourage people to have that uncomfortable conversations um, and to really speak to our elders and older generations to change their old mentality, change their stereotypes. That's a long fight. I understand that. And it's very, it could be very difficult, but I think it's so necessary, even though it felt kind of hard to open up that conversation. But I think it's also important to include that in my book because maybe it's shared with a lot of other uh, Asian families uh, or Chinese families as well. I think like in the conversation about how it's difficult to um, speak up with your, speak up to your family about like um, important topics like Black Lives Matter. I think mm -hmm. that's, that's um, such like a relevant topic for many like uh, Gen Z kids because um, oftentimes like, parents who immigrated over here, they often have a different mindset growing up in their country and then immigrating over to um, the United States or to other countries and starting a new life. Mm -hmm. And I think like as our, as like a second generation um, Asian, it's important to like start these conversations with them because um, I, I've also grown up with a different mindset. And like now, like since we're more privileged with um, a new life and being able to not struggle like they have we have different struggles like being able to um, speak up about like the injustices that are still prevalent in our system um, yeah but in like regards to um, moving to a new country and like having to adjust I know like for you um, when you had like a host family in the UK and Colombia um, you mentioned how you had to adjust but did you have any uh, cultural shocks? Yeah, it was actually very interesting because I was I was very young. I don't know how old are you guys. I feel like you guys might be younger than me. Uh, I'm eighteen. A lot of us are seventeen, though. I think Carolyn and Kelly are eighteen. I think yeah. So like seventeen, eighteen. Yeah. yeah. You guys are so young. Well, actually, not 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 that much younger than me. But because of you guys are so well articulated, I thought you like you you guys are like graduates. Um, uh, I don't know. Like, thank you. <laughs> no, I yeah, you guys definitely way outsmart me uh, compared to when I was seventeen and eighteen. So, are you guys in high school? Sorry, I'm just asking random questions. I'm curious. No, yeah, for sure, we're all yeah, we're high school seniors. Yeah, yeah, oh. so we're graduating this year. Oh, congrats! You all go to the same school. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which city or states? Uh, it's California, like in the Bay Area. Oh, like cool. near San Francisco, around that. Yeah, oh, it's a beautiful place. I always wanted to visit. I heard a lot of good things about the Bay Area. I know a lot of celebrities are from that area that I always wanted to visit. <laughs> yeah, a lot of like tech startups and yeah, just mainly like technology and coding and all that stuff. I feel like that's the general stereotype of the Bay. Like, yeah. <laughs> 
Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, oh yeah, going back to the question, sorry. Yeah. Um, the question about cultural shock, right? Yeah, so um, it's very interesting because um, I, when I first went to the UK for gap year, um, I was at, you guys age, I was 17. Um, so like just traveling along, uh, traveling alone to another country by myself, it already felt kind of scary. But um, I was very lucky. I stayed with five different host families from completely different backgrounds. I was very shocked, to be honest. Um, so the culture shock comes more from I didn't know what to expect, which I think was a great thing at the same time. Could be a little bit risky, but also a great thing because I didn't have any assumption, pre-assumptions about what they're supposed to be like. Um, and so I went to international school when I was in China. I had some contact interaction with people from, you know, different uh, like foreigners, you know, or foreigners kids, uh, but they're mostly white. Um, so when I first went to the UK, I stayed with a Muslim family, I stayed with an Italian family, and then a mixed family, a Japanese mom with a white dad. Uh, it was so great to see how different cultures interact with one another. And I will say this, I put this in my book too, it was featured in my book. Um, when I was in this Muslim family household, um, that was my first time seeing people pray. I, I don't know if you guys are from like religious family backgrounds, but I have never seen uh, my family pray or pray in a way that it's just, they took it very seriously. That's their, uh, that's their routine practice. Uh, and I saw the grandma prayed, she, she was on her knees and she was cry, She was in tears when she prays because that's how real, that's how connected she is to uh, the prayers. Um, so that was very shocking to me the first time I saw it. I remember asking my host family mom, I was like, is grandma okay? She's crying in the bedroom by herself. And she was just like, no, she's just praying. Um, so we're just gonna give her some space and time. And I love that. And I thought that was very fascinating. I, I, that's my first time seeing closely how people are so connected to their religion. And another shock I would mention just specific to this family um, is that I was, because I was at home, so I just felt um, very natural to wear my dresses around uh, the household. But I was told by the, uh, by the, by the, by the, by the eldest daughter that, um, so, we should cover ourselves more in the household because there are also other men in the house. There's a son and then there's a father in the house. So we need to be more respectful. And I, you know, and then I, I thought about that. I was like, oh, okay, that's, that's about respect. And I need to respect that tradition in their household, in their house as well, right? Um, and one last thing is just the mom was also, they're very generous to me. Uh, they said to me that having a guest in your house, even if you're not uh, well off, well off it's a bless it brings blessing to your to to your household and just hearing that that just that's very beautiful and later on I told that to my parents and I just saw I just felt like it's also very common it's like a shared kind of um feeling with a lot of you know Asian household as well we see our guests as a bless to our family right when you have friends over your your parents friends over they would bring everything out even if you don't have anything in your house they will bring fruits they cook food they will literally bring all you have in your house to and then you know to welcome your guests so I think that's shared between our two cultures uh, I was shocked a little bit shocked at the beginning but then the more time I spend with them, the more similarities um, that I find between the two cultures. And it just, it was a very beautiful experience. Yeah, it does. It sounds, it sounds so interesting. And on the topic of like anecdotes, you also mentioned in your synopsis that like there are stories of, about you trying to find that angry Asian um, figure while navigating yourself through um, your emotions during like the surge of like anti-Asian hate crimes. And so we're wondering, how do you see characteristics such as the angry Asian or bad English tropes slash stereotypes um, playing a role in the legal world? Mm -hmm. I love that question because that just sounds like you, you guys did so much research and you know that I'm working as a legal assistant. It's, um, so about angry Asian, I use that term and kind of, I kind of had like a play on the word because um, I, by, by angry, I really meant having someone who is 
very who is activist who um is outspoken you know who is out there courageous enough to speak up when something uh bad something violent happened to our community so by angry i really meant in a more positive way rather than a you know stereotypically being angry or being not um you know just being difficult so i feel like i didn't see enough on tv about that you know that aspect or that image of asian people um as we all know a lot of times asian women are hyper sexualized on tv on you know uh, in social media and i was um yeah i was just having another conversation with my friend earlier today about she's in fitness and she feel like she didn't see enough asian representation or asian woman representation in fitness because asians the stereotypes about asian women is now we're not strong we're not uh muscular so i wanted to see more you know uh different types of the asian images on tv representations so yeah by being angry, I feel like it's really a way for us to 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 show how outspoken, how out there we can be. Mm, yeah, and about bad English, I talked about that because that was part of my struggle of um, coming to Canada, and also a lot of struggles that shared by a lot of Chinese students, Asian students, or even international students. I definitely. I relate to that a lot because I saw a lot of my friends who are Asians, but because their English is not as fluent as, you know, a native speaker. So they kind of get isolated from the classroom, um, you know, from the professors, from their peers. They just, um, you know, eventually they just got pushed to the, the corner of the classroom. And that's not their fault at all. I just think, um, our society quickly judge people's intelligence and their capabilities by the by you know by their uh, by their by the language by how they speak. So I think that's also shared by a lot of immigrants' experience. So I wanted to talk about that and how it impacts it in how you know how it comes to play in the legal field is that I feel like it's heavily impacting people who speak English as their second language or third language, fourth language, um, because legal field is all about how you speak, how you write. Um, right now, as a legal assistant, I do feel like uh, because I am able to speak English fluently, so I have the privilege to, to work on that job versus someone who maybe speaks with an accent. I feel like um, that would be, th there is some kind of discrimination against people who speak with an accent. Uh, there's a pre assumption there, and I wanted to challenge that. Yeah, I think what you brought up about like the discrimination against people speaking a foreign language or just a language that isn't their own is so important because um, when you talk about like your whole like cultural shock from studying abroad, uh, mm -hmm. it kind of brought me back to how I'm actually going to be studying abroad this summer too in um, South Korea. And I'm like really worried that um, my Korean, my like basic Korean won't be enough for my host family or that like I will just experience a huge cultural shock there as well because I feel like I have to represent being Chinese and being American as a student and like kind of like proof to them that like I I'm not here to impose like anything I'm just here to learn from you and hopefully like be a better guest in your your country and so I just thought that was like really interesting in all your stories as well thus far like this is all so amazing um in terms of Kelly, because you're speaking about uh because you talked about um you know going to Korea and not maybe not probably be able to communicate so fluently. I really want to share that. Please don't worry about that because I went to Colombia. I wasn't able to even compose a sentence in Spanish. Um, I just went there because I kind of thought maybe there are young people there who can speak English. I'll, I will just hang out with them and I'll learn when I get there. And then I spend uh, like three, mm, one month with my host families, completely not able to communicate in each other's language, but somehow it worked. Um, that's why I, I feel like so important to have an open mind because one, when you really go into their household or when they welcome you with an open mind, language barrier is not a barrier. It's just not a real thing. I don't know how it works, but eventually I was able to pick up a little bit, some Spanish to communicate them with basic you know, sentences. Um, but because of the, the open mind, we're just listening to each other and somehow it just, somehow it just worked. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, so circling back to our interview. So uh, you talked a lot about your like, experiences, your personal anecdotes when you were creating your book. So we want to know like 
what do you think was one of the most surprising things you learned as you were going through the process of writing? Um, I will name um, two things. Uh, one is how little I actually know about the Asian community in Canada. Um, I would say because in Canada, I think this I think the uh, the social context is a little bit different from the US. I, I know that there are a lot of the Asian immigrants, uh, you know, in the US, a lot of people, first generations immigrants. Um, however, in Canada, the the more common cases that um, a lot of people are recent immigrants, especially when we talk about um, the the South, sorry, the uh, the Southeast Asians, for example, a lot of people from Laos, um, from Vietnam, they fled from the war uh, from the countries not just just not so long ago. Um, so a lot of them came to Canada as very recent immigrants. So I feel like when we organize a community that is so kind of young in a social, in a you know sociological perspective, kind of young community, it is more difficult to organize them as one group because a lot of them still have a lot of association, you know, as I think uh, Carolyn who mentioned that or Amy mentioned that you still, I think Amy mentioned that, um, still, you, you still have a strong connection association with your home countries. Um, so, you know, how to mobilize them and how to kind of like implant this idea about being Asian as a one group um, for them that there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. And another thing I would say um, I found very, um, you know, I discovered while writing this book is actually how interconnected our Asian community is with a lot of other people of color communities. Uh, there's this one chapter I, I wrote about um, Asian indigenous relations. I felt like really there isn't a lot of literature's focus on that relationship because a lot of times when we talk about history we talk about how we are in relation to white people right i think that's very common how asian compared to white or black and white relation however it rarely not a lot of books focus on the relationship between people of colors so so yeah, in this in this book, I I discovered that while I was writing that, while doing research, I discovered that there is a there's actually a long history of Asian or you know Chinese labors, um, and indigenous people coexisting, you know, intermarrying, and that was that just opened up a whole new world to me. So you know, like knowing that we had a history of knowing each other, contacting each other, even though there are conflicts and tensions, but there is a relationship there. Uh, so it's really great to see. And I, yeah, so that's something that I also discovered while writing it. And I wanted to see more. I wanted to, to more people to go into that history or that field to read more about it, to discover more about it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so hearing the wide variety of topics you're bringing onto the table is very incredible and inspiring to hear. And um, I just love that you're addressing the, the like discriminatory issues that are both within and outside of our community, especially because people in our community tend to avoid some of these topics because they're hard to talk about. So as you're preparing to publish your book, how do you anticipate the people around you to react? And what do you hope they're going to take away from your story? Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, so up until now, so far, um, I received a lot of positive feedback, po support from um, friends, families, and just people who found me on social media or even from you guys. I feel like if it's not because of the book, I would probably never have a chance to meet uh, Kelly and all of you guys, you know? So um, the positive uh, support and help, it's just, it's very overwhelming. And I was so surprised to see that. And it's so great because I feel like it really opens up conversation um, from, you know, just even across the, the border. Um, actually, just before our, um, this, this chat, um, I was just speaking to um, to, I think, college boys from Mexico. They also found me on social media and they were interested in learning about, you know, anti-Asian racism and Asian community. And I just thought that's just so amazing to bring the world together and to have conversations with people from all around the world, from different backgrounds. That really means a lot to me. And so, yeah, so, so far I've received, it's all positive, positivities. So I hopefully, hopefully that would be um, the reaction of people, you know, just down the road as well. 
Um, and what do I hope they take away from reading my story? I think number one is that I want to challenge model minority myth. Uh, which is internalized, as I mentioned, internalized by a lot of Asians and is still accepted by a lot of uh, other people of color and white people. So I wanted to challenge that. I want to show how diverse we are. I want to show how um, outspoken and how strong we can be. Um, that's something I really want to showcase. And second of all, I really want to see more allyship between people of color. Um, I constantly have this conversation with my black friends or with my boyfriend. I think um, a lot of times the, um, the tension or conflict comes from we don't understand one another or we don't, uh, we don't care enough about each other's struggle. But this, you know, since last summer, Black Lives Matter movement to this summer, um, you know, about to be summer, uh, protect Asian lives. I think these activism, these movements really bring communities together and we're seeing each other as, hey, I see your struggle and I hope you see mine too. You know, I will support you. I hope you will support me back too. So I think I really love to see more of these. Um, just having conversation and, you know, uh, with, with other people of color helps a lot. And I think writing this book, I hope um, more other groups, you know, other racialized groups can also see through, um, you know, Asian people struggle, Asian people's experience, and hopefully they understand more and they would also love to show up for, for Asian people. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. I know that was a lot, but you made a lot of good points. And I think like everyone in the room completely agrees that it's so important now than ever to not be divided and not try to like pin the blame on any like one specific person or group. Like it's important to acknowledge that this issue isn't gonna be fixed with just one or two people coming together. It's everyone collectively acknowledging that there is a problem and working together to solve it. Okay, so all right, that wraps up our interview with Vicky Zo. Thank you so much again for sharing your incredible story and insights with us. Thank you guys so much for having me. It was such a great conversation. And by the way, I really love the questions. I feel like just uh, reading through the questions when I was preparing for them, I feel like you guys really did your research. A lot of stuff, there's really good questions. Carolyn, why are you laughing? <laughs> No, I was just saying like, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> because I feel like uh, I did a couple of interviews before, prior to this. Um, and I just feel like those questions are very generic. They're very broad. It, mm -hmm. Basically, like, what do you think of the, you know, the anti-Asian racism at, the, you know, at this time? And it's, it's like, yeah, I can talk about that, but it's, they're so broad. There's so much to talk about within 30 minutes, an hour. But these questions are so specific. I actually had to... Um, you know, on my way to work on subway, I was like thinking about them, and I will continue to think to think about and reflect on them because I feel like they are, um, you know, as time evolves, like they, I would have more um, thoughts uh, to them, and I will probably incorporate a lot of them into my book and add on to it while I edit my book. So this is very great. Thank you. We're so happy to hear it. Um, Amy, did you want to say something? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> you guys are so sweet i really hope to um you know maybe we can stay in touch with each other on i'm on social media i'm on uh instagram um so yeah hopefully we can stay connected yeah of course thank you so much again um yeah so that's pretty much it for our episode uh we'll be back soon with another one please stay safe and healthy everyone bye yeah bye have a great weekend bye. have a great weekend <laughs>